Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar from the UK Customs Academy, in which we look at how the Northern Ireland Protocol could operate for UK businesses. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I will be on hand to facilitate any questions or queries you may have during this webinar. You can use the control panel to the right hand side of your screen to ask questions and send in comments at any point. And we are also recording today's webinar and sharing a link to the recording after our after the session and you can download a copy of the slides in the handout drop down in the control panel. Cool, thank you Kevin. Uh, the UK Customs Academy has been set up by KGH Customs Services and the Institute of Exports and International Trade at the request of HMRC to enable businesses and individuals to gain the knowledge and skills around international customs that will be essential for trade in the years to come. The Academy is evolving to become an essential resource for industry professionals that not only offers leading edge training and edu education, but also a unique range of individual and business membership benefits to support the profession, providing invaluable business resources, advice on industry best practice, and a virtual community for industry professionals. Thanks, please. Now, before we begin today's main presentation, we're going to be running four different polls uh, during the webinar today. And the first one is a simple one, just asking where everyone is dialing in from. Obviously, it'd be very interesting to see uh, how many Irish uh, either side of the border are here today. And um, so the options are Great Britain, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, other EU nation or the rest of the world. And while I give you a few seconds to consider, well, you should know <laughs> these options, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, who is Kevin Shakespeare, Director of Stakeholder Engagement at the Institute and a regular webinar speaker on Brexit for the Customs Academy. Hi, Kevin. I will, thank you. Great, so I'll give everyone just a few more seconds to answer that poll. I'm just going to share the results now. So uh, a fair, obviously the majority from Great Britain, which I suppose isn't a, isn't a surprise given our usual audience, but there's quite a high percentage there of Northern Irish companies there as well, so 14%. Hopefully this will be useful to people in all regions of the UK and beyond, including the Republic of Ireland. Anyway, uh, at this point, I'm gonna hand over to today's presenter, Kevin, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Will. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present uh, to you today. And uh, can I just start by saying a thank you if anyone's on the uh, uh, on the webinar today who I've spoken to um, uh, over the last few weeks uh, and even last few days. So uh, we've uh, at the Institute of Export and International Trade and, and other organisations and partners we're, we're involved with, we've had a, a high number of webinars and activity around um, uh, the NI uh, protocol uh, and impacts of, uh, of uh, post-transition period trade. And, uh, and if I've spoken to you and, and you've um, obviously provided good feedback, uh, thank you very much indeed. And it's al always very interesting to, to hear some of the issues because we liaise quite closely with, uh, with uh, HMRC, HM Treasury, uh, and we put forward uh, a number of initiatives following the calls uh, that, that could take place to help um, uh, trade uh, with Northern Ireland, uh, both GB Northern Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland GB and wider. So thank you very much. So today we are going to look at trade post-transition period. And it's quite interesting if I roll it back probably a year or two, we've been involved heavily with uh, with uh, post-Brexit, post-transition um, period. And, and I must have spoken and, and, and met with a, a very enormous number of companies uh, over the last uh, uh, 18 months. And it is fair to say that initially a lot of the focus was on uh, United Kingdom trade with the European Union, which included the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and then, then the focus also started to, to, to get involved in trade in services and then increased reflection on trade with the rest of the world and some of the key impacts that, that could arise as well. Um, and it is fair to say at the moment that the uh, considerable focus on GB trade with Northern, uh, Northern Ireland and then how trade interacts with the Republic of Ireland and the European Union and the rest of the world. So uh, I wouldn't say a slight change in emphasis, it's still the uh, the first two emphases are, are, are there with regard to the EU and the rest of the world, but a, a really big focus in the last couple of weeks. 
So um, let's just start by a few statistics and information. Uh, and what this uh, slide shows us is the significance of um, uh, Northern Ireland trade with GB. So far higher than, um, than with the Republic of Ireland, the rest of the EU and the rest of the world. And we can see there in terms of external sales uh, in 2018, 10.6 billion pounds worth of trade which was actually down from the previous year. And in terms of purchases, 13.3 billion, which was trading services as well as trading goods, but the majority was trading goods. So the sheer significance, especially when you can um, compare that with trade with, um, with other countries uh, and other trading blocks as well. So that's really sets the scene on the importance of, uh, of this area. So uh, if we look at it in the context of NI goods purchased from GB, we can see that the retail and the wholesale tra uh, trade uh, and motor vehicles to some extent um, dominate uh, as well as manufacture of food, beverages uh, as well. But we can see the, the domination and the extent of those two sectors. And, and in, in many respects, the, um, uh, the food retail side is, is, is probably one of the sectors that's going to be most impacted potentially and has most considerations um, following the, um, the, the announcements and the continued announcements that hopefully will take place shortly. So that's NI goods purchased from GB. And, like, and likewise, NI goods and services sold to GB. Uh, again, food products are uh, very, very high on the list and, and, and also civil engineering very high and wholesale trade again is, is, is high. But again, manufacture food products uh, are, are, are key as are beverages as well, which is quite interesting when we look at excise goods and, and we have a slide on that uh, uh, later. So we can see a predominance and a, and a, and a theme here uh, but clearly, there's lots of different types of businesses in terms of machinery, equipment as well, computer programs, which also have an impact. So let's now get into some trading specifics. So um, really uh, come to the core of, of what we're going to discuss today. So we, we, we will and we have looked at previously goods originating in, in the Republic sold to Northern Ireland. So the, the working principles are no border checks, no customs declarations, no tariffs for goods mo moving from the Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland. And the same principle applies for goods entering the Republic from the European Union. Exactly the same. If of course, the goods have originated from outside the European Union and they enter the Republic, um, then they will be subject to customs declarations and applicable tariffs. And we're going to look at that later and we'll look at an example from the United States. Um, and, and why is this the case? Because Northern Ireland remains aligned to EU rules. However, what happens if those goods transit the Republic uh, and um, Northern Ireland then to access GB? they may be subject to customs procedures and applicable tariffs. So that's a very important point. Now, I say may, it probably will be subject to customs procedures and applicable tariffs if it moves through Northern Ireland onto GB. And, and yes, that might partly impact on the trade routes. And we're going to look at the trade routes very shortly. So that is a, a key potential principle, which is why it's important for businesses to maintain records and documentation throughout. Let's look at the trade routes now then. So um, uh, clearly in, 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 in terms of the trade routes, we've got examples here of Liverpool to Belfast and, and um, this is um, obviously by sea, eight hours. Um, uh, we have in, 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 in the case of Scotland, a very close route in, in Cairn Ryan to Larne and Belfast. And that's really applicable there in, when we think about how goods can get to Scotland. So in, in, in many respects, it's, it's a lot quicker um, to, um, to use the Larne, the Belfast route to get to Scotland and obviously uh, goods coming from Scotland. So that's a really key consideration here for both Scottish businesses um, as well as um, Northern Ireland businesses and Republic of Ireland businesses as well. A really key consideration. Um, we have Liverpool to Dublin, a, 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 a heavily used route. And, and when we think of Liverpool being a major global container port uh, and, and uh, putting a lot of investment in, that's important. And then we have Hollyhead to Dublin, which is very much the quickest route. 
um, in, 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 in terms of entering the shores of Great Britain. Uh, it varies. I put three hours, 30 minutes. It can be quicker. It can be uh, 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 slightly longer in some cases. So that is a very heavily used route, clearly for, for, for Welsh trade. And if anyone from Wales today would obviously uh, be very happy to uh, to hear from you. Uh, we are doing something on, on Wales specifically in a couple of weeks, but um, uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you as well. So um, those are trade routes. And so when we think about where business moves, this is vitally important in terms of um, where trade goes and what the impacts could possibly be. So um, NI goods sold to GB. Let's look at that. The, um, I'm going to frequently refer to the NI command paper, which, which followed or more recently followed the withdrawal agreement. And it, it laid down some principles. So one of those principles was that no import customs declarations as good ent uh, goods enter GB, the rest of the UK from Northern Ireland. The principle was no entry summary declaration as goods enter. Uh, I would say this is the command paper and these are the principles. No tariff supply to Northern Ireland goods entering the rest of the UK in any circumstances. And I would stress their Northern Ireland goods. No customs checks, no new regulatory checks, no additional uh, approvals uh, and no requirement to submit export or exit summary. So we talk a lot about safety and security declarations through this and we must distinguish them currently from customs declarations. They are different. So um, any trade um, with the European Union, currently as, as the UK is in a transition period, safety and security declarations are not required. But any trade with the European Union to, uh, with, to or from the EU, from a third country, requires safety and security declarations, the safety of goods entering the shores of a country, which is different from the customs declaration. So it's important to, to draw that distinction in terms of safety and security. So the safety of goods entering the shores uh, of the UK, uh, Great Britain, uh, uh, the shores of the European Union as well. So those are the principles outlined in the command paper. So goods sold to Northern Ireland. So let's GB goods sold to Northern Ireland. This is really important. So the working principle in the command paper was that goods sold from GB businesses to Northern, Northern Ireland businesses are not subject to applicable tariffs. Well, that's the working principle. However, the command paper refers to only those goods ultimately entering Ireland or the rest of the EU or at clear and substantial risk of doing so will face tariffs. And again, to stress that tariffs would apply if there is no free trade deal between the UK and the European Union. And there's also been a lot of talk around goods sold for further manufacturing. So they're part of um, production processes components has also been at risk. And We've probably been hearing this more from some companies, whether that's in food manufacturing, uh, in in engineering manufacturing as a whole, that they're hearing those, uh, that they're being advised that though further manufacturing could be at risk as well. Uh, the command paper also refers to the fact that although there will be some limited approval on goods arriving in NI, and we can talk about that uh, some limited approval because that's a key term as well. This will be conducted taking account of all flexibilities and discretion, and we will make full use of the con concept of de uh, dramatization. So trying to make it as simplified as possible. That is the principle. Uh, and, and I guess we can use simplified when we refer to customs, but we can use it in terms of processes as well. It's a, it's a term we, we sort of probably understand from a customs world. There will be no physical checks um, where possible, but there is an acceptance for some goods, agri-food, especially products of animal origin, that there will require to be checks. Because ultimately, uh, these these are, are a risk of entering the shores of the European Union. The European Union, in terms of its agri-food standards, is probably the strongest in the world. So uh, th therefore, uh, uh, checks on uh, products of animal origin and, and, and plants uh, and, um, and, and fisheries, seafood, uh, for example, will be required. But again, the wording is proportionate although I would stress the EU does have the, uh, the opportunity there to just apply the standard controls. So it is fair to say in all this that it is two parties involved in this, uh, well, three parties uh, in, in terms of Northern Ireland, uh, the GB 
and the European Union as well, and four parties if you include the Republic of Ireland in that as well. So um, good soul to Northern Ireland continues. So I just wanted to go through some other principles because this is clearly evolving and we very, very much appreciate that businesses need certainty. And we're trying to obviously com convey that important message as well, because the, the shorter that businesses have to plan, the harder it becomes. And we will refer today that some some planning that you, that you can consider. And we know some businesses have, have done some excellent work there. So um, clearly the final uh, outcome in terms of tariffs depends on the uh, negotiated settlement between the EU uh, and, and, and the United Kingdom. And that also brings into areas of, such as mutual recognition. And we hear a lot about this concept of a, a level playing field as well. But the UK government have added three adjectives to the term at risk, substantial, genuine and clear. And the joint committee of all parties has to determine the at risk register. That has not been determined yet. And we're obviously awaiting further announcements of what that at risk register will be. Um, it does uh, acknowledge, the UK government acknowledge additional checks will be needed on products of animal origin, including fisheries, which will be implemented by expanding existing facilities in Northern Ireland, uh, currently used for checks on live animals. Uh, and very, very conscious that that HMRC, HM Treasury or, and, and border, uh, 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 border Group are advising us that they are engaging with the ports, uh, with the points of entry, across GB and Northern Ireland. Uh, SPS, sanitary and phytosanitary checks, uh, will include identity checks, documentary checks, and physical examinations. We'll endeavor to keep them to a minimum. However, they could, it's acknowledged they could be in line with current EU testing requirements. And as stated in the, in the actual protocol, all processes will be enforced and implemented by UK authorities. But clearly, this ha all has to be agreed with the European Union. Now, th this is an interesting slide, and I would strongly stress that this is an evolving picture because we're getting lots of questions on this. Uh, I will talk through it. This is an example of what could happen. It's not necessarily what's going to happen, and it's an evolving picture. We're involved in in a, in a uh, obviously in. Um, in, 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 the, in the picture here in, in trying to put the view of industry uh, uh, forward to, to the likes of HMRC, HM Treasury and the Cabinet Office currently. So today at the top of the slide, the example trade journey from GB to NI today. Uh, you might recognize that to some extent from INCO terms. And we'll talk about INCO terms because we don't always think about INCO terms for what is purely domestic trade. Inco terms now starts to come greater into the picture. So the goods available at the seller's premises in GB, goods loaded onto the lorry. The lorry then moves from the seller's premises to the GB port of dispatch. And we looked at examples of, uh, of that port of dispatch, the likes of uh, 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 Liverpool, um, Haysham, uh, Ken Ryan, for example. The goods leave GB. The vessel sails from GB to Northern Ireland. The goods arrive at the Northern Ireland port uh, and then taken, for example, by lorry to the uh, to the buyer's premises or uh, a warehouse storage facility, for example. So that is currently the process as we know it. Now, a possible trade movement for, uh, from 2021 could be, and I would stress this is subject to check technology. We've had loads of questions on GVMS, which I'm going to refer to, verification and validation. So it is subject to a, a lot of potential points here, and it's an evolving picture. We are hearing some community software providers, freight forwarders, telling traders, importers, and exporters about GVMS. So basically, what it could look like is a pre-lodged Northern Ireland Customs Declaration. And again, the, the, the language we're hearing is as simplified as possible. So um, obviously that could be few transit as, 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 as the UK is still part of the Common Transit Convention. It could be for an entry into declarants records, um, EIDR. It could be through some other form of simplification. The emphasis, the word we're hearing is simplification here. Uh, but again, what it could like is some form of NI customs declaration. A safety and security declaration will be required. 
again, th this is uh, th this is what the picture could look like. A GVMS, so GVMS, goods vehicle movement system, is in development with the intention to track movement of goods across the Irish Sea. And the customs declaration is processed during the actual crossing, during the process of the vessel crossing. And uh, obviously there's air freight as well. Uh, and the vehicle is checked or held, inspected as appropriate, depending on the type of goods, depending to make sure it's it's a, uh, the, the likes of a safety and security declaration and, and the customs declaration as and if appropriate is is actually handled now what i would stress is we're, we're happy to take individual questions um gvms and and you may have heard something different we're being told is in development uh and um and there is due to be a, a border operating plan or further um notices by mid-july whether that is the full border operating plan or just an update where they are i am on a call monday morning between 9 and 11 a.m which we may get further details. So um, just wanted to bring that. So let's consider additional considerations here because yes, GBNI, but there's other considerations and every business on this call will be different. So some NI businesses quite understandably um, and there'll be uh, there'll be intercompany trade as well, and we're going to talk about inter intercompany trade because this is uh, really important. Uh, may use, for example, Dublin Port or Dublin Airport uh, for wider access outside of the Republic, and they may have storage facilities there, for example. Uh, so, it, whilst it may be quicker to use Dublin, we looked at Dublin to Holyhead, certainly not for movements from uh, from Belfast and Larne to Scotland. That's certainly not the case. Um, but custom, the principle is customs declarations will apply for movements from Dublin to GP. Um, that's the principle. Again, we're trying to to work to see if if, uh, if we can suggest any um, any uh, simplifications. I don't like using the word in this case to try and help businesses uh, who, who will be impacted by this. So freight routes, trade routes become really, really important. And we'll speak about transit in the UK to go to European Union as well later. Dublin to EU, NI exports to the EU via the Republic would not be subject to tariffs and customs declarations, um, but liaise with your freight forwarder, that becomes absolutely key. Uh, Dublin to the rest of the world, NI exports to the rest of the world will be subject to customs declarations and tariffs depending on the underlying trade agreement. And that's really important as well. And we're gonna look uh, at an example of that later on. So um, goods originating in Northern Ireland exported to Republic, that's probably just reaffirming, no border checks, no customs declarations, no tariffs. Uh, but also it's about regulatory alignment with Northern Ireland as well. Northern Ireland remains aligned to the European Union. Uh, so for areas like the CE marking, agriculture, environmental protection, uh, chemicals, the likes of REACH legislation, current standards must be maintained. Uh, and this is an interesting slide as well. So goods originate in Northern Ireland, export to European Union, as we said, have the same principle. So very conscious that there is a container route from Belfast to Rotterdam, uh, which doesn't go, um, doesn't enter the shores of Great Britain. Uh, that will not, uh, that will apply in the same way as goods move into the Republic. No border checks, no customs declarations, no tariffs. That's what we're hearing. Obviously, there is there, there is potential for that, I guess, but that is the general principle there because NI is aligned to the European Union. And obviously the same for Belfast International Airport uh, for air freight going to, uh, to the European Union as well. So uh, NI goods moving through the UK, this is an interesting one as well. Uh, um, again, we can see examples of the trade routes there that, that certainly could apply in, for example, uh, Belfast to Liverpool. Um, uh, the, current, um, the current principle is these movements will require customs declarations and procedures if they move through GB to the European Union. And I guess France would be a prime example if it's, if it's uh, Eurotunnel or Dover Calais that's used there. Now, we're very much aware for trade with the Republic of Ireland that transit procedures should be able to use, but transit is a, a, a procedure that requires financial guarantees, whether the trader has it themselves and they apply for transit uh, uh, authorization or whether they use their freight forwarder. 
uh, to, uh, uh, to, to apply transit procedures. So, um, and that's certainly a, a solution for goods moving to the Republic of Ireland through Great Britain, probably uh, England or Wales, obviously, uh, primarily in this case, but um, there. So, um, but there would need to be an interpretation in theory to it to apply for goods from Northern Ireland. Again, we are trying to uh, to argue for that uh, 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 for that process to happen to help Northern Ireland businesses. There, uh, there need to be an interpretation. I would stress transit is not a European Union um, uh, process. Transit was around before the EU, before the Union Customs Code, and it's it's subject to different arrangements than uh, than the authorizations under the Union Customs Code. So uh, now I'll pass back to Will for some uh, for a poll, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. So the second poll, uh, let's check what it is. So the second poll is, what would you most like to see for NI in the post-transition lib uh, in, and for NI in post-transition liberalised trading? So the options there are a zero tariff UK deal with the EU. NI retains access to the EU single market, freedom to market invest NI message globally. I imagine with the slightly larger GB audience today, we might have a, a relatively obvious answer to that, but we shall see. Um, while letting that poll run, uh, just a question from Brian, picking up on what you were just saying, Kevin. So he's asked, is transfer from NI to EU via Ireland and UK mainland still going to be possible? And what does that supply chain look like in practice? Well, it's a really interesting question. Very happy to take that offline. So um, what you're probably talking about there is transit or movement from Northern Ireland to the Republic, let's say Dublin, for example, or it could be Cork to Santander potentially as well. Um, oh, no, sorry, it wouldn't be because it's going through GB. So so, so let's say to Dublin, to, to Holyhead, to Liverpool, uh, and then moving through through Wales or England as appropriate to, for example, France, um, and then possibly on to Germany as well. So it's going to be really interesting there as to the interpretation of transit. So if it if the goods had started off from the Republic, then the interpretation of transit could could definitely be interpreted as the transit special uh, procedure can arise. Um, and you could argue, in Northern Ireland being aligned with EU rules, that the interpretation could also be applied as well. So again, I think that's something that we're we're looking at to to actually. And I appreciate some of you uh, on this uh, may be involved in in committees as well. Uh, may also be asking the actual same question around the use of transit. So something we're looking for clarity on, because no doubt it would help Northern Ireland businesses uh, dramatically. But good question. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Brian, for the question. I'm just going to show you the results of that poll now. So unsurprisingly, 79% uh, said a zero tariff UK deal with the EU, but 13% uh, looking for NI to retain close access to the EU single market, and then just a 7% on the marketing of invest in NI message around the world. Uh, back to you, Kevin. Thank you. And um, when we talk about the message around the rest of the world, we, we will have a look at that because um, it is the rest of the world trading is still very important for, for, for GB and for Northern Ireland. And we will look at some examples of that uh, uh, as well, because um, throughout all this, we mustn't look, lose sight of potential opportunities. So further considerations of which there are, they are, there are many, and, and I probably haven't covered them all today. So let's cover rules of origin. This is another big one. So uh, the working principle is that NI origin goods under U uh, will come under UK trade deal and not EU trade deals. Uh, so they, in theory, could come under EU trade deals if the EU agree, but the EU would have to amend all their trade deals to include NI goods in EU origin. So then they would have to go to uh, all, every trade deal they have um, and uh, seek to include NI goods into EU origin. Now, that would be obviously great for NI businesses, but there's a lot of work for the EU. And bearing in mind when the EU do that, 
every single country, every 27 member states of the EU has to agree. It's not just the EU Commission uh, effectively agreeing that. They have to agree with all 27 member states. So if it's not maybe in the interests of a certain member state, and I guess for agricultural products, there's probably one or two obvious ones there, then, then uh, it, there's a lot of discussion needed. But the working principle is that NI origin goods are covered under UK trade deals. So clearly that has big implications for NI trade with countries outside the European Union. So if the UK, it depends, I guess, on how many um, uh, existing trade deals uh, that the UK is able to sign continuity agreements for. Uh, we've, we have covered that in various other webinars and we're happy to do so if you want to, to go over trade with the rest of the world and EU trade agreements, please let us know again. Uh, implication two, what is the impact of NI goods in, in, in uh, a Republic of Ireland finished products? Again, this is quite interesting as well. So will the ROI finished products meet the EU origin threshold in the case of a preferential trade deal with the UK? And, and this, again, is really interesting. Uh, I guess there could be some form of agreement which, uh, which simplifies the interpretation of origin and takes into account the unique position on, um, uh, of all the, all the parties concerned. I guess that's possible. Uh, and then there's the interpretation, which some of you will clearly be familiar, of last substantial transformation. So whether it's a change in the commodity code, in the purpose or the function, the amount of employment created uh, 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 through taking a component part or an ingredient, there's a lot of interpretation needed there. Again, we would stress if you think your business is affected, and I've spoken with a number of you recently on this, possibly on the call today, possibly not, um, then uh, please, again, reflect on it. You're, you're obviously welcome to contact us in that respect. Uh, we are clearly receiving a huge number of uh, uh, calls and interactions at the moment. So, but do reflect on that if you feel that's an issue, because we know the integration of supply chain between the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, the other way around, is absolutely huge. There's huge integration, not just in, in dairy, in agriculture, in other products as well. And then uh, implication three, what is the impact of, of RRI goods in NI finished products? Well, yeah, very interesting here that that could depend on the destination of the goods. And it clearly, uh, if um, NI, N, um, if NI um, origin is linked to UK trade deals, how it's interpreted. So if there is a trade deal, for example, with the with the United States or Australia and New Zealand, then th that interpretation becomes quite important if your business is trading with those countries. And, and certainly uh, businesses may need to consider a binding origin information, a BOI. That could become increasingly important. I did see on a government uh, note um, that maybe there's an element of confidentiality about it, that there, there is expected to be a lot more requests on binding origin. So that becomes really important. So could do consider the origin. Uh, it is, it is going to be absolutely fundamental and key issue uh, as well in meeting those rules of origin. Uh, again, there could be, if there is a UK-EU trade deal, the origin requirements will be will be agreed at, uh, at a um, uh, at a tariff line level, um, but businesses must consider where the origin is, the element of last substantial transformation. So we will talk today about the need about the availability of the 50 million pound customs grants that's available to traders, importers and exporters, as well as intermediaries. So I want to make that point clear. It's available to traders and we've had a high number of traders who are using it to do qualifications and training uh, and do make sure because things like last substantial transformation is a key part of the learning and a key part of what's discussed, the rules of origin are a fundamental part as well. So understanding of those is really important because the trader has that liability and the customs grant scheme is for, is for capacity building, which includes traders as well. So trade ag agreements in, the, in, in negotiation. So this is also an interesting one because this is about what the future could look like as well. So what are the implications of a UK trade deal with the United States? And for the likes of Northern Ireland and, and GB as a whole, United States is a big market. Um, uh, for GB as a whole, United States um, or the UK as a whole, United States is its biggest export market if you take it on its own as a country. 
so it's huge and it's big and it's big for Northern Ireland as well as well as as well as it is for GB so um, but what happens if we have goods of US origin entering through Dublin and move into Northern Ireland would they be able to access if there is a UK US trade deal or would tariffs apply because there is no likelihood under under the current administration of a US E, uh, EU trade deal, and additionally, the, U, uh, the US has hit um, the EU with additional countervailing duties uh, following the um, the, uh, the Airbus dispute, and and the EU has some uh, 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 additional duties against US products as well. So really, th this is a big moving area as to how the UK uh, operates with this environment. And as we said, Northern Ireland origin goods. Uh, as clearly sit within in in the UK. So I know a lot of people today will be from GB businesses, but you may have you may have manufacturing production facilities or sister companies in Northern Ireland as well that you've got to consider. Um, or, or it may be that obviously a, U, a UK US trade deal will, will will help you if you're based in England, Scotland, and Wales uh, as well. So perhaps it's unlikely. The theory is is that the goods enter through Dublin that there will be tariffs applicable um, unless again there is some form of negotiation that, that accepts that this this could happen so um, that's something obviously to consider what is the impact of a UK trade deal with New Zealand New Zealand obviously a huge agricultural production that might that's a key topic of discussion in in the UK trade deal with New Zealand what happens there as well and and um, Obviously, there could be upcoming announcements on trade deals that we need to look out for. Let us consider Africa as well. Africa is a priority for the UK government. It's clearly said it. And there is a new African continental free trade area. Yes, you could argue this is for the big manufacturers and, and the big infrastructure companies, of which there are many. But is your company part of a supply chain here? So UK Export Finance, who, who do a fantastic job, provided £780 million of support for UK exports to Africa last year, which was up from 85 million five years ago. Number one priority, that included 110 million pound financing for a new maternity hospital in Ghana. So sustainability, environmental products, projects are key in terms of the, um, uh, the whole agenda. So if your company is part of a supply chain, it's not just the global multinationals, whether that's a, a German company, a French company, a, 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 a UK company, if you're part of that supply chain, that becomes the emphasis on Africa and the African continental free trade area also starts to become very important for your business. Uh, so let's look at VAT. VAT is an interesting one as well, and I guess that you, th there are some uncertainties here, but maybe it's maybe it's it's clear what's going to happen. It could be uncertainties. As part of the withdrawal agreement, Northern Ireland has a dual status with the EU VAT, Customs Union Single Market, still part of the uh, EU VAT and the Union Customs Code. So goods moving between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland continue as movements across EU borders. Uh, and Intrastat remains. Um, the EU in its technical papers, and again, you could argue this is subject to negotiation, state that supplies of goods between Northern Ireland and GB will be treated as exports and imports for EU VAT purposes and excluded from intra, intra, Intrastat. So that could have some big implications. But clearly, operational arrangements need to be clarified in terms of the dual VAT system that will operate in Northern Ireland or certainly hopefully operate in Northern Ireland. So again, VAT, if you're a, G, if you're a GB company, you, uh, obviously there's implications for yourself there, um, uh, there as well. Customs special procedure. Now, this is a really interesting one. We've had lots and lots of questions on this. Um, and if you haven't considered this, you do need to consider it. We, we, we've we talked in other webinars around custom special procedures, even even end use, authorized use, really starts to come into play here, as well as customs warehousing, inward, outward processing. And we need to consider this in the context of NIRI GB. So it's going from GB to NI to the Republic of Ireland, uh, GB to the Republic of Ireland, back to GB or um, uh, to the European Union. And so many considerations here. So businesses do need to consider the, the, uh, the, the component parts of the finished goods um, and whether these custom special procedures can apply. 
also obviously custom special procedures bring into play financial guarantees and the benefits of authorized economic operator status in terms of waivers 100 percent waiver from the customs comprehensive guarantee become more compelling and whether any waivers can be introduced around financial guarantees to help businesses this time is something we've been pressing for for a long time and is something uh, which we'd like to think is still on the agenda however the uk's interpretation of the uh, union cut of, of um, now it's outside the union customs code of the likes of the um, uh, RKI the revised Kyoto agreement is going to be very interesting and it's something obviously a lot of thought is being given to but you if you're you're involved in processes here again by all means let us know we've had conversations with a number we've even had people talking about GB to NI back to GB trade can we use a kind of procedure for that so a lot of considerations there and we're very happy obviously to to try and support businesses in that respect transit as we've talked about could also be very very important there so is is the is the prescribed end use of the product changing as well that becomes important also becomes important in terms of further consideration shortly excise goods europa eu the eu indicate the NI uh, Northern Ireland Protocol provides that excise rules apply uh, with respect to the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland is outside the uh, UK excise rules. So transactions involved in movement of goods between Northern Ireland and the other parts of the United Kingdom will be required, guarded as imports or exports for the purpose of EU rules on excise. And we know obviously excise is, uh, is, 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 is one of the larger products being exported and imported. So uh, movements of excise goods between uh, Northern Ireland and EU member states will be treated as movements between EU member states. So you have the summary there at the bottom of this slide in terms of GB to EU member states, importation, GB to NI, importation, exportation, NI to EU uh, and EU to NI, intra movement. Those are obviously key as well in that sector. So further considerations, and uh, we, we could go on about so many, I've picked out some. Intercompany trade, moving between GB and NI and NI and GB. Uh, are invoices issued currently? What documentation is provided? We've had this discussion with several companies as well, because the trade documentation, commercial invoices may need to be raised. There needs to be an audit trail probably, as we can see. What INCO terms will you apply? Suddenly, INCO terms become uh, more relevant than they have been hitherto before GBNI trade. Audit trail of documents becomes absolutely key. Proof of export, proof of import, proof of sale, proof of purchase. It's good practice now to have it for GBNI trade as well. The issue of trader liability for customs declaration remains as important as ever. You, the importer and exporter, are liable, not the intermediary binding origin information requests, and also commodity codes. You've probably heard me talking so much about make sure you have the correct commodity code. This becomes, this brings in um, commodity codes into so many transactions, especially with the integrated supply chains between NI and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, it becomes so, so important. Uh, so if commodity codes are changing, that has various implications for the likes of last substantial transformation, for example, and origin, but you need to make sure you have the correct commodity code. Suddenly, a lot more commodity codes are gonna become very, very visible there. So again, another reason why grant schemes, accessing the importance of getting the correct commodity code, learning about them becomes important. And then there's a whole issue around geographical indicators, which is also a very, very important issue, uh, both for trade with the Republic of Ireland, uh, for NI businesses and for GB businesses. So um, it's, it's a wider issue, the likes of Scotland, Wales and England, geographical indicators are absolutely huge issue, as are potentially EU trademarks. And again, we're happy to take questions offline on the importance of that and and, uh, and and whilst you could argue there are um yes in certainly in scotland there are lots of geographical indicators and it's a huge issue uh for wales northern ireland uh, and england it's also a big issue as well if you're part of supply chain to those organizations to, to those products with gis that becomes important so again the final message um 
and and I'm very conscious speaking to some that the awareness maybe that grant scheme funding was was um, was not available to importers and exporters. We obviously want to get that message clear. It's definitely available to importers and exporters. We want you to be ready for efficient customs processes and efficient customs procedures. Right. So we have another poll or a couple of polls, and I'll pass to Will now. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So the third poll is which of your following is the biggest concern for NIGB trade? And the options there are the UK leaving transition with no trade deal, lack of detail and time to prepare, requirements for customs declarations and procedures, which is there twice. So if you could, sorry, that's a bit of a mistake on my part. So sorry about that. But if you could uh, vote for the top one, that'd be good. And then VAT procedures. Great. So while that question is ongoing, uh, Kevin, we've had a question in from Paul, who's asked, for NI to EU direct trade, I take it interest tax reporting would be required. Is that the case? Uh, NI to EU, that is the case, definitely. Fantastic. Um, and then another question we've had in from Linda, who's asked, do you see CDS, the Customs Declaration Service, as a game changer over Chief, and what are the pros and cons? Okay, thank you for the question. It's a really interesting one. There's been a lot of debate around Chief uh, and CDS uh, recently, as, as well as interest that's been brought into the conversation. So, um, I guess just to confirm, and apologies for, for those of you that are familiar, the concept of CDS is to uh, replace the chief system. There has been an indication that two systems will run parallel for a period of time. Uh, chief was meant to have been, in, uh, sorry, CDS is the new system, was meant to be introduced by now, uh, but um, uh, it's um, it hasn't taken place yet or fully taken place yet, so there'll be some parallel running. There has been talk around GB2NI trade being solely via Chief in terms of some of the solutions and simplifications, uh, but th those are, are under discussion and that's, that, that, that is not the case until we actually hear if that arises. So it's probably not going to be less a case of Chief versus CDS. Uh, in theory, it's going to be more that if we look forward into the future, CDS is going to be the system. Uh, and, and, and CDS helps uh, the UK meet some of its trade facilitation commitments under WTO trade facilitation agreement. Uh, and, and it helps to produce more uh, eventual movement towards electronic documentation. Uh, which which will happen. It's it's just a question of time there and, and how long that's going to take. So that's probably more that, that uh, CDS is, is the future system and the chief system there's, uh, there's now, but there will be parallel running. Um, and we're very conscious of businesses that you will need to prepare at some stage and whether you're an intermediary, a trader as well, because you are ultimately liable, that you will have to prepare for new fields in, in CDS uh, and, and an awareness of uh, of what the new system and I appreciate there could be some of uh, companies on this call that have been involved in the pilot to trial uh, process for CDS. Thank you. Thank you Kevin and just to share the results of the first poll as uh, so the top was on 41% lack of detail and time to prepare followed by uh, the UK leaving transition without a deal on 31%. Uh, some quick maths will tell me that requirements for customs declarations is 24% and then VAT procedures at the bottom there at 4%. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, our, our last poll, and again I'll ask Kevin a, question, a couple of questions while you answer it, is how prepared do you feel for changes at the end of the transition period? And the scale there is from very prepared to not at all prepared and there's a not sure option as well. Just following on from that last question, we had a question from Andrew earlier um, who said, we've been informed that GVMS is closely related to CDS, which isn't likely to be ready for January 2021. So what's the plan for customs declaration if GVMS isn't ready? 
<laughs> it's a very good question and uh, so GVMS as I've indicated is is under development or that's what we've been ad advised and clearly if there are software providers on on this call you, you will be just as familiar if not more familiar with that than ourselves um, yes you're correct in that chief was indicated as as being a key component of it uh, that may still be the case but it's also the case that other solutions uh, are being uh, are being investigated as well. Uh, that's probably the best way of putting that. Further announcements are due, and, and those announcements have to be made quickly. Certainly, uh, uh, the, the likes of a joint customs Com consultative committee and the minutes of which we are part of uh, have have advocated that Chief uh, is linked, if you like, to GBNI trade. Um, uh, but uh, let's say that other options are being investigated. That's not ruling out chief in any res uh, sorry, in ruling out CDS in any respect. Uh, but uh, I, I was on a call earlier this week where that was indicated, and I'm on another call Monday as to whether there's any update on that. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, another quick question um, from Percy, who's asked. If Northern Ireland remains aligned to EU rules, will they remain in the single market? Yeah, so uh, effectively, you, you, uh, again, the argument could be that Northern Ireland remains aligned to the customs union, the single market and VAT as well. So all three. So the answer is yes to that. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I'm just going to show the results now of that poll. Uh, so. 46% are quite prepared, 6% very prepared. So it's a 50-50 split almost between prepared and not quite there yet. 34% uh, not very prepared, um, which is slightly different to other polls, interestingly. So thank you again for answering that poll. If we move to the next slide, um, if you have any questions, that's where you can ask them and in the control panel, uh, just go to the question drop down and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next five or so minutes. So a question from Eduardo who's asked, is there any NI special or additional requirements for imp imported food and drinks to fulfill? So um, in, 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 in terms of drinks, if it's, if it's beverages or excise goods, then um, we, 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 we covered that in terms of requirements. They will be treated as imports and, and exports as appropriate, uh, uh, as noted by, by the European Union. Uh, for food, uh, the argument could be it depends on the type of food. So if it's products of animal origin, live animals, they will be subject to checks. And, 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 and the command paper has indicated that. But for products of animal origins, the, the, the UK or the command paper would like those to be proportionate uh, and, uh, and, uh, and as, as reasonable and as logical as possible. So the argument is it does depend on the type of food in terms of the actual checks, the, uh, the SPS checks. Thank you. And a question on the grants actually from McCullough, who's asked regarding the grant, can companies not currently doing customs declarations get money for IT or staff? At the moment, it is only for training. Um, you can for IT, can't you, Kevin? Yep, you can. You can do IT and there's an element for recruitment as uh, sorry, staff, well, staff training as well. There's a little bit of an element for recruitment. You need to check the rules of the scheme. But the, the idea is for capacity building to make customs declarations. So yes, the, the answer is you can for IT. So, you know, so likes of purchase of electronic badges, um, a front end software, that sort of thing. Thank you. And we've had a couple of questions, uh, which I think would be quite inter interesting just to kind of talk through the procedures. So Bill's asked, what customs requirements will be required for EU to NI via Irish Republic? And Katie also asked, goods travelling from GB to NI via Dublin, would these require a transit document and then import in NI? Okay, so the first question, if I've understood it correctly, so EU, EU, EU to to the uh, to RRI uh, or other EU to RRI to Northern Ireland. If the goods stay within Northern Ireland, then um, there are no additional requirements to current. If the goods stay in Northern Ireland, if they move from Northern Ireland to GB, uh, obviously that position could change. 
Uh, the second question, and apologies if I've misunderstood the question there. The second question, GB to ROI to NI, could transit be used, is a really, really interesting question. Uh, and we have had this uh, elsewhere. Probably I'd like to take that offline depending on the nature of the goods. I suspect I might know what the nature of the goods are, but um, probably depending on the actual nature of the goods. Uh, I'd just like to maybe take that offline. Um, the, the argument is, it, that is, is that if it's GB, it is going through uh, uh, transit. So it's going into the European Union. The argument is, is Northern Ireland considered part of the European Union? Is it going back out of the EU into GB? It could be a question of interpretation. So I'm very happy to take that question online, offline because I can actually see um, uh, what this, uh, how this could be interpreted. It might depend on the product though, I would stress, uh, whether it's live animals, products of animal origin or uh, or let's say standard products uh, if we use if we use a, a recent term so it might depend on the product very happy to take that offline because i can definitely see the logic there it, it, it makes eminent sense thank you thank you thank you kevin uh, a question in from claire who's asked will eu level suspensions still apply in ni for end use items would applications be to the uk or eu for new suspensions and based on ability to purchase in the eu or the uk Oh, that's a fa it's a fantastic question. Um, it, it's probably one where you could argue that Northern Ireland has a, a if, if, if we used a proverbial term, a foot in both camps. So Northern Ireland is still part of the Union Customs Code, and that raises some very interesting connotations. If any Northern Ireland businesses have warehousing facilities in 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 mainland Europe or mainland European Union, say in Belgium or the Netherlands, that raises some very interesting questions. Uh, in 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 that uh, in in theory, your your existing authorizations can continue to apply without having to apply to the customs authority. So that's that's one point. Uh, I know that's not necessarily answering the question, but that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting interpretation there. In in that in that in that Northern Ireland is also part of HM revenue and customs uh, and part of UK controls. So um, I'd probably like to take it that if Northern Ireland businesses have authorizations or AEO in the ROI or in, in the mainland European Union, then, that, then they can continue to use them without having to make a separate application. Uh, so that's, that's clearly a benefit for NI businesses. Uh, with regard to using them, if you like, or new procedures as to whether it comes under the UCC or UK, you probably would have thought it would come more under the UK. But again, probably just need to understand the circumstances of, of, of the business and, and, and where the trade is and, and the types of authorizations. I know end use, I think, was uh, authorized end use was mentioned there. So probably just need to understand that a bit more. But it, it's very interesting. I think it, it depends uh uh what um what, what the supply chain is so but very happy again to to take that separately because it's a it's a fantastic question thank you great thank you thank you kevin uh we'll do a couple more questions uh we did have one person asking about slides slides will be circulated after the webinar um with a link to the recording um, another question we've had in from Tanya is if we export materials from UK to the Republic of Ireland for processing and then bring the final product, product back to the UK, will we pay double tariffs? So um, if you're moving goods from the UK to any EU country, which, uh, which, which, which Republic of Ireland is, and you bring the goods back, the theory is you will pay double tariffs. However, it does depend what you're, how you're using the goods. So the likes of inward processing might be applicable there, which has clear tariff benefits under the revised Kyoto Agreement. So um, again, it's needing to understand what you're actually doing. Are you making a sale to a third company? 
and then you're buying the goods back, which which clearly is 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 probably more going to be yes two tariffs, or are you using them as part of a, a manufacturing and a production process? Then you've got big opportunities in terms of customs authorizations, and in many respects that's going to be through discussions with customs a key solution for many businesses. So again, learning about customs authorizations, applying for customs authorizations is going to be key. And we are seeing a big spike in, in applications and companies using that as a, as a solution. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I think we're actually running pretty low on time now. So on that note, I think we'll have to wrap up. Um, so thank you again for, to Kevin for the presentations and the answers. Um, and also thank you everyone for answering our polls and also for sending in so many great questions. We'll, we'll try to look at some of them afterwards as well and see how we can support. Um, but for now, on the final slide, you will find details about how you can get in contact with the Academy. If you have any further questions or queries, um, please do let us know. And if you have any suggestions for topics for future webinars, please let us know them as well. I will leave the slide open for a few seconds before closing the webinar, but for me and Kevin, goodbye, stay safe and have a great, if hot, weekend.